Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Mike O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program, and on behalf of my good friend and our president, John Allen, who wrote the preface to the book we're about to discuss this morning, uh, welcome. And we're delighted to have Fetty uh, from Italy, our good friend and non-resident senior fellow, uh, and, and Kareem from the Atlantic Council down the street. I, I think you can read about their bios and their many accomplishments in the handout, but I would like to just say a couple of words of personal uh, reflection because they're both very good friends and outstanding analysts on Libya's history as well as Libya today. We're going to talk about both those topics sequentially, starting with Afede's book, which you can find in the back, and it's for sale. So, Vincere by Federica Seni Fasanati, uh, and it is a history of a part of the 20th century and Italy's role in North Africa, which sets a lot of the historical and intellectual backdrop uh, for understanding Libya today. Kareem Mezran from the Atlantic Council was part of our project here a couple of years ago in which we talked about a cities-based strategy for trying to work towards a more stable Libya, ideas that have been complicated by a number of things since, including the various military maneuvers of General Hiftar and the intervention of some more foreign forces complicating the security environment in Libya even further. But we'll get to that subsequently after talking first about the book. So I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to start in with some uh, questions for Fede. But since she's come all the way across the ocean, I thought maybe we could all join in a round of applause for complimenting her on the book and welcoming her back to Brookings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, much. so please tell us about uh, the title of the book the, and why you chose this time period, why it's important. Uh, you've got a distinguished career as an historian. You've written about other periods uh, of Italy's role in North Africa before, but why this topic, why this period? Okay, um, the, the name of the book is uh, Vincere, and uh, Vincere was a way of telling of uh, uh, Mussolini uh, during, uh, during uh, the fascism, and means to win. And uh, the second part uh, of uh, this motto was, uh, and we will win. Uh, of course, the, the fascism uh, regime has been uh, a military regime in many respects. And um, w I, I chose to, to talk about the operations that uh, fascism, but not only fascism, because uh, the, we must know that the military operations in Libya start during the liberal regime, during the last part of Giolitti uh, government. And so it was not just Mussolini wanted to conquer Africa. It was a, a question of, uh, a matter of uh, uh, geopolitical and international uh, protagonism in many respects. Italy didn't have uh, African colonies. And in those times, uh, having colonies was something of, you know, re related to prestige. And uh, so they, they Italians started to, first of all, in the Horn of, of Africa, and then they went to Libya. And uh, they started with a regular war against uh, the Turks uh, that was very quick. Uh, fast uh, and uh, not very much violent. But then when the Turks went away, they realized that there were someone else in the country. And, and I'm, I'm talking about Libyans. And um, the rebellion against Italians uh, was extremely uh, motivated uh, in Libya. Of course, uh, Italians were um, the foreigner. They were not Muslim. They were Christians, so many layers, social, historical, anthropologic, made uh, the fact that uh, Libyans did not want, rightly, Italians. And so from, uh, uh, let's say, 1922, uh, Italy found uh, itself uh, without uh, a real uh, territory in Libya, because during the uh, First World War, of course, the Royal Army, the Italian Royal Army, had to move in another chessboard, which was the Western and the Eastern chessboard in Europe. And so they lost every outpost of Libya because of the Libyan Mujahideen starting to take every single place again. And so in 1919, after the war, Italy had to decide, do we want to leave the country or not? And they decided to take it and to start what we call the Reconquest. 
and uh, that was in reality a real conquest from zero. And from that moment on, uh, Italy started to do military operations of counterinsurgency. And I chose, uh, to answer your question, this period and another period, which is the military operations in Ethiopia from 1936 to 1940, because they are real uh, counterinsurgency operations made in Africa. And as far as we know, talking about Libya, they went in many respects, in military respects, they were a success, even though they cost a lot to the population. So we have to, do, to say also this. And um, in this regard, I, I want to say one thing, uh, because I, I really studied uh, these operations, and I want to ask Libyans, if they are here, to forgive Italy, because it's been really bad. So I, I want to take this stage to, to ask to forgive you know, what Italy did uh, in, in, uh, in those moments, terrible moments. But in military terms, uh, uh, it was a success. And so Italians uh, uh, turned out to be much, much better in irregular operations than in regular operations. The two wars, and above all, the Second World War was really a failure for Italy. So let me ask about the military success and what you mean by that, because I'm intrigued, and I've read your work before, so I have some sense of, of where you're going, but just for everyone else's benefit as well, and to hear it in your words today, we know that there are at least two major schools of how to do counterinsurgency. There's the school of thought personified in part by, I dare say, John Allen and some of the other American military greats of the modern era uh, in, from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's been a tough couple of campaigns, but it's been a population-centric protection of the population. Try to build a political system that makes, you know, and it, obviously not just a military operation, but a broader political yeah. and economic one, that tries to give people buy-in and, and thereby hopefully reduce the degree to which they view the foreigner as occupier versus state builder and temporary presence. Uh, that's sort of the American NATO way today. But there's also the Russian way, the <laughs> President Assad way, and, and, a, and a way that historically perhaps the United States used, you could say, in some ways against the Native Americans although maybe that was not really thought of as counterinsurgency. In any event, m much more of a, of a tough iron fist. There were obviously a lot of iron fist elements of the NATO efforts and the U.S. efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan, but there was an effort to try to get the population to support as much as possible, whereas many times in the colonial period, we know the European powers did not do that. So can you situate the Italian approach along that spectrum and explain to us, uh, I know that the approach, I think, was better than, let's say, the Belgians in my former Peace Corps country of Congo. Uh, but I really don't have a good, well, I'd like to hear you explain in, in your words, uh, you know, give us a good understanding of how you would define that Italian military approach. Well, it was absolutely ruthless. I mean, in many respects, Italians, uh, we have to, to think that the idea of the buon italiano uh, doing nothing bad, uh, but just trying to improve the lives of uh, indigenous people, it's, it's you know, something that doesn't exist. Yeah, so, here goes the myth of uh, yeah. mandorina pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it, it, it was just uh, a fake news. Mm -hmm. And uh, in reality, the Italians' operations were really tough uh, and ruthless. Uh, and uh, uh, the Libyans and Ethiopians, by the way, had to pay a huge price for those operations, civilians. Um, because you must think that we are talking about uh, insurgencies. And so we have no regular armies here, but just men that maybe are you know, taking care of the animals or the soil, lands, and so on. And at a certain point, they get a rifle, and they go and, uh, and fight against uh, the colonizer. So in those times, we are talking about 1922 until 1940, of course, conventions, human rights, uh, and all these kind of things did not exist at all. And even though there was something against gas, for example, a convention, uh, but no one took care of this, absolutely. And so uh, I, I'd say that the model was much, much more similar to the Russian way uh, of uh, uh, you know, behaving in, in, in those terms. Although we have to say that some officers 
were really uh, enlightened, and uh, they, they, I, I read their, their reports uh, to the, the, the leadership, the military, military Italian leadership, that, and, and they told, we must take care of the people. That's uh, the, the, the real thing we have to do. We cannot leave them alone, because in those territories, you must know that the problem was uh, of internal, another problem was of internal conflicts. So if you disarm, and this is a problem that we can touch today. Mm. Uh, if you disarm uh, a group of people, of civilians, they will be without any, any, you know, uh, security against marauders or against brigands uh, or whatever. And so that was a real point for the Italian colonization in those times. Two more quick questions, then I want to go to Karim for a Libyan perspective on this. And again, you've been very, uh, very generous in your approach, recognizing the mistakes that your country has made. So uh, I know that Kareem is probably uh, going to feel comfortable expressing his views as a Libyan, but I wanted to make sure we understood the end of that time period. So 1940, the, the end of the time period is essentially the beginning of World War II. Is that what then requires Italy yeah. to pull out? Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and that was the main reason. There wasn't, yes. It wasn't a separate decision. No, because uh, Africa became a chessboard of the Second World War. And so we had operations both in the Horn of Africa and uh, in uh, uh, the North Africa. And uh, at that point, operations were regulars and uh, conventional, let's say, war. And uh, Italy went really bad. In, in, and so in 1940, the counterinsurgency operations uh, are completely forgotten and comes you know, the moment of uh, the fight against the British uh, and so on. And then just one last question, which is to not quite bring us all the way up to the present. We'll do that in the second round of discussion when we talk about Libya today. But to bring us up to Gaddafi. So from 1940 until Gaddafi takes power in the late 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, how, would you so how would you describe Libya in that next 30 years? What, what was basically going on? Okay. I know there was some degree of, of effort at central rule, but yeah. how did that evolve over those 30 years? So immediately after the Second World War, there was a kind of protectorate uh, managed by the Allies who won, so French uh, and British. Um, and then, uh, uh, which is a very important period, by the way, in order to understand uh, uh, still uh, the maintainers of the three, three regions. Um, and then there was the Kingdom of Idris, uh, that was another particular moment for Libya, um, with many problems also there uh, during, during Idris. Idris was a Cyrenaican um, leader, and uh, he was in many respects, uh, uh, I don't want to say this, but he, he was not so interested in governing the country. He was an intellectual, so he was not the right uh, person, let's say, in that moment. And to remind people, Cyrenaica is which part of Libya today? East. Yes. East, so, and, and then there was a Tripolitania, and then uh, there is the big part of desert, uh, which is Fetsan. Yep, very good. Thank you. Uh, and again, Fantastic book, which he's going to sign for anybody who would <laughs> like to ever sign their copy after we're done with this discussion at 12 o'clock. Kareem, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. And I just love your thoughts uh, on the book first, and then we'll come back to a second round and talk about solving Libya's civil war as advertised in the event. Uh, yeah, title. I want to know who chose that title. Yeah, I think it was <laughs> me. <so. laughs> not, not a friend of mine. <laughs> But so let's start with an easier topic, uh, singing the praises of Fetty's great book. Be, uh, be, 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 be good. Eh? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> I'll be and, 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 and more generally, how do you look back on that period? Of course, uh, you're a young man. You weren't alive then. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, you probably have some fa family <laughs> that, that, that talked to you about that period. How do you see it? How do Libyans see the period that she's writing about? Uh, I'm very attached to, the, to, to that period emotionally, because that was my first time I encountered it the realities of politics. As a seven-year-old, I went to my mom and asked her, Mom, who was Omar Mukhtar? Because I was doing that in school, at elementary. And she said, oh, my father immediately jumped in and said, he, he was the leader of the independentists, of the liberal nationalists, of the patriots. My mother looked at him and said, Omar Mukhtar, wasn't he the, the leader of the bandits? <laughs> so that, I was a kind of puzzle. And that's the more I understood that politics is, you're always a freedom fighter for someone. 
and the terrorist for someone else. And that guided me throughout my life. In, 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 in always of looking closely to what is the evolution on the ground. Brought me back to a, to a period, not, not, not from a political point of view, but from a military, was something I have never done. I've always studied the colonialism as the brutal invasion and repression, and then I, I, I and, and what came after was really where my interest laid. The four, eight years between 1940, 1948, 1949, 1950, where the Libyan entity was being built from, from, from the bottom. I mean, it was an attempt from the bottom to build a Libyan nation or a Libyan identity or a Libyan structure. And those, I, I think, are the fundamental years to understand Libya, because it's a passage from a dominated country into an independent country, mm -hmm. how it was structured. One thing that people tend to forget is that Italian colonialism, yes, officially, with all its, with all its wars and battles and, and clashes, ends in 1940. But a lot of Italians were in Libya. Yeah. There was a huge community. Up to the point that when Adrian Pelt came to, to uh, the, the guy was appointed by the, by the United Nations Security Council to go to Libya and see if Libya could become an independent country. When he formed a committee of 10, he included a representative for the Italian community. Five were foreigners and, uh, and, and, and four were the representatives of, of, of Libya. One was, to, to signify how important it was, especially in Tripolitania, where, where, where the Italians stayed much deeper than they did in, in, in Cyrenaica, because while they were still fighting in Cyrenaica, they were beginning to build their penetration into Tripolitania. So the, that, that is a pivotal moment. If you don't get all these passages, the, what, what's happening today seems something foreign, something external. But Libyans have always fought to, to, to maintain, especially under Gaddafi, the idea of, of a unity, of a state that, that could signify something more than the, the, the agglomeration of, of, of three regions. How, how old do you think of Libya as being as a country in terms of a meaningful unification of the three regions? The late 40s, there was a lot of debate. Are we going to have a monarchy? Are we going to have a republic? The division, the decision to have a federal country was as much based as the differences between the various regions, physical, but also in the, in the wish. We should not underestimate, whenever they say, but Libya was always divided. In the 40s, the battle was not whether you were a Benghazi or you were a Tripoli or you were a Fezanid. It was, do you want a monarchy with the Senussi or do you want a, free, a republic? My grandfather, who was a representative of, of, of Tripolitania in, in the Commission of Ten, was not of the idea that you are from Tripoli, I'm from Tripoli, you are from Benghazi, you are separate. The idea was we want a republic. We want a country that is based on a national vision. We want a country that is based on parliamentarism. We want a country based on constitutionalism. Against other peoples in the East, the Omar Mokhtar Club and others, who wanted the, the, the Sanusi king as the king of the whole of the country, if not only of the East, which in 49, with the help of the British and the declaration of the Emirate of Cyrenaica, was a, a viable option. That forced the Tripolitanians to accept the idea of, of, of a king and the, and, and the position of a federal monarchy. It, it, it's, it, it's not only the, the, the objective differences in mentality, in culture between the region, it's not so much that as the vision for the future and the identity. And I believe that in those, th those were the foundational years. And those are, and, 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 and I'm really at pain when I saw that the new elite that came after 2012 did not pay much attention to that period. Mm -hmm. Because that is the, the period where the Libyans really fought. There were foreign influences, undoubtedly. But the common vision of, of that elite to say, we will, we will be independent, we will be one and independent, is what forced the extend apart to, to, again, to, to, to give it up and accept the realization of this entity. Thank you. So let's have a round of discussion now about Libya today. 
And I want to thank Fred Wary for being here as well, whose, uh, whose book, The Burning Shores, is one of my other great favorites uh, <laughs> and explains what's been going on this decade. We're now almost 10 years into the post-Qaddafi period. It'll be nine pretty soon uh, with the Arab Spring and then the subsequent period of conflict and Qaddafi's overthrow and death in the fall of 2011. And since that time, we've seen essentially in some ways anarchy, but it's also been, as Fred and Kareem and, and Fetty have explained to me, uh, it's a kind of anarchy that still allowed some degree of normal functioning society and infrastructure to continue. There's, if you go to Libya today, I'm told, uh, or at least for much of this last 10 years, there is not a sense of complete lawlessness as in, let's say, Somalia or Afghanistan in the 1990s or certain periods where we just think of complete mayhem. There, is a militia-based system of security that's pr sometimes pretty capricious and arbitrary and sometimes pretty ruthless. And the country as a whole doesn't glue together very well, but there's still been some degree of preservation of a functioning state for much of that time, partly because Libya has oil and it's therefore had revenue to share. And there's never been a system of distribution that's been widely accepted for long, but there has been at least some revenue to share across different parts of the country. I'm going to let these two correct me in a second, by the way, with describing where, where I think we stand in Libya today. But just to set the table, then ask each of them to correct me or add a couple of additional details or factual reference points, and then we'll discuss where the international community should go from here. But as I think many of you know, since April of last year, General Hiftar from the East, sort of a self-appointed strongman who stylized himself as a person bringing order to an otherwise lawless country, uh, but also, in many people's eyes, is greedy for power and seeking to control as much of the country as he can himself. He has swept westward. He's taken much of the oil-producing area in the center of the country. Uh, and, but meanwhile, Libya's oil production has gone way down as a result. And he's also attempted to take Tripoli, but he's found that he actually can't do that, at least not yet. However, he's invited Russian help. And we now have a complex dynamic with foreign actors, including Turkey uh, and the United Arab Emirates, being even more present on the ground in military support for one side or another than before, all in violation of a UN arms embargo, and potentially bringing more chaos to the country uh, and certainly more risk to Tripoli as a city than had been previously the case. So that's how I see it. But I'd like to ask the real experts to correct me, round out the picture, and then we're going to talk about policy options before we get to your questions. So how would you describe the situation today relative to what I just said? Well, no, you, you were precise, and uh, the situation is very bad. Uh, Aftar started this siege uh, uh, against Tripoli the 4th of April last. And of course, it's still going on, uh, in spite of all uh, the help that he can have uh, from uh, Russia, uh, from e the Emirates, and from Egypt. Um, Egypt has always been, with al-Sisi, has always been interested in uh, spreading uh, its uh, influence uh, on, uh, on Libya. And this is very natural. I mean, during, just to go back and forth, during the Italian colonization, Egypt was, was one of the biggest points uh, of uh, problem for the Italians, because with the border so, uh, you know, so um, easy to pass through yep. um, in the poros, the, the rebels or the Mujahideen came back and forth continuously and had all the support they needed from Egypt. And today it's pretty similar. Uh, Al Sisi is helping, uh, in spite of all, uh, you know, the, the United Nations resolutions, is helping uh, that part uh, of Libya in order to conquer the other part. And that's, of course, uh, no deal uh, from uh, Tripolitania. But there are many differences if we analyze uh, the two chessboards. Uh, because in, in these 10 years, what we can see is something, let's say, uh, is Yurinaika much more uh, regional in many respects, with the figure of Aftar as uh, a military and political leader, although they should have a, a House of Representatives and an alternative form of political govern. Um, and on the other side, we have a more local way of governing uh, the region in Tripolitania, so more local, let's say. 
uh, with many different militias, uh, a complete uh, oligarchy, I, I, I should call it, um, that tries to uh, maintain the situation of anarchy in many respects, because it's very useful for them. And uh, by my point of view, uh, probably you know, the, the militias in Tripoli will never accept uh, the, the, the conquest uh, of Haftar, never. Haftar, uh, and Karim can, uh, can correct me or add something, has, has, you know, has been seen as a criminal in many respects and as an invader. And uh, so I think that the situation will be like this for the next few months and more. And more. Before I ask Kareem for his thoughts, I, I was intrigued. You've twice used the term Mujahideen to talk about the resistance fighters in the colonial period that yeah. you focus on in your book. Were they Islamists in the modern day sense, or were they more anti colonialists? How would anti -colonialist, you? Anti colonialists, yeah. for sure, but they were fighters. Yeah. And so it is my way to uh, give them respect. Yeah. And uh, I don't, as I told you, I don't like to call them rebels at all because studying every single operation of, you know, 10 years of history, of Libyan history, every single operation, I can tell you that uh, they were extremely valuable fighters and they fought for their country and we don't have to forget this. And um, they were really motivated and very good and almost, uh, Every commander, Italian commander, had to write this. We are fighting against uh, real fighters. So they, they, they really had the respect of Italians in, in many ways. Just a quick footnote, I might note that in Mujahideen terms in Afghanistan, of course, this term is also a very positive one, at least from my point of view. I think at this time we have big debates about Afghanistan and we see a peace process perhaps start up a, a little bit. Uh, we have to remember that they really helped us win the Cold War. The Mujahideen really not only yeah. fought for their country, they did enormous uh, benefit for the broader Western cause against the Soviet threat during the Cold War, and that was really the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. Kareem, how do you see things in Libya the, today? The, 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 the term Mujahideen is tied to, 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 to Islam, to Islam and Islamic religion. And the fighters in Libya were, 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 were members of the, of the uh, Sanusia, who was a Sufi Tariqa. Their common vision, yes, they were fighting for independence, for taking the, the foreigners away, but deeply rooted in the Islamic tradition of the of Sufism and the Tariqa. Yeah. That was their common thing. Up to the point that somebody says that seeing in the Sanusi fighters, the fighters for Libya is could be a stretch because they were really fighting for keeping the foreigner the the infidels out of the area that they were living in, they were fighting for. It's, it's debatable. You can, you can, there is enough argument for, for, for to, to support one tier and to support the other. But that's why the term Mujahideen. What was your question? Well, how do you, apart from what we've already said, what else should we understand about Libya today to create a good factual foundation for the policy conversation? What's, what's the most important additional fact that you would either add to a, the, you know, what we put on the table or that you would challenge me in the way I describe things. Yeah, here is where I begin to make enemies. <laughs> I, I really think that the most important thing today to look at is not to believe that the two traditional narratives or the traditional narrative that sees as general Hafter, self-proclaimed general or legitimately done so because of the House of Representatives yes, being the only true. legitimate one and, and all the sort of thing as being the representative of the grievances and the instances of the people of the East against the peoples of the West who are now, in this moment, prey of Islamic radicalism, but traditionally controlled the resources, the resources that were centralized. So having this vision of the general professional military who is secularist, who fights terrorists, who is prone to democracy and the red just he wants to impose order for a few minutes and then he will open up yeah. to the country and develop the country in a western sense the, the, the sense that you should like against those who are in the west who are militias islamists part of the big islamist conspiracy that some of, of our writers here like like like, like to represent 
that they, all they want is isolate the country and plunge it into the Middle Ages. My colleagues here, they, 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 we have talked a lot about this, and we all, we are, we all know the, fa the fallacy of this, of this narrative. Haftar is not the representative of the East. Not only he comes from Sirt, but only he is being created by foreign power in particular, maybe to impose with the resources to the large majority of the people in the East, where he installed a military regime. And we have seen that since the beginning, when he was substituting every mayor regularly elected with a military commander, mm -hmm. military governor, and by military, we just mean because they were, they, 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 they were wearing a, a uniform, because there is no Libyan army professionally trained, independent, and nationalist in its outlook. The creation of Haftar and of this, and of this situation in the East is, and, the, and the strength of this narrative that has been spread at the international level with incredible, incredible success. Because we are here, any time I go to people away from, 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 from those who know about Libya and they go to the, to, to, to the average citizen, to the, to, to the normal audience, that's the, that's the narrative that is there. And we can fight against it, we can undermine it as much, or we can write it against it, we can bring, bring proofs, we can demonstrate, and, to, and, 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 and it's there. And for some reason, it's, it's what has penetrated. It's, it's the, the good and the bad idea. And that, I think, is the most dangerous one, because it is creating Eastern Western difference that is the, the, between the, the population that is the, that I, I I don't think is there. There are differences, but there are differences in every country of the world between the regions. If you want to dig them, if you want to find them out, any any European country you can say the North is different from the South. There is no no way that the two of them can compare. It's the political narrative that is going to create a division. A di uh, I, I, I'm when I'm pessimist, which is most of the times. I, I really see that it has been created, a division within the Libyans. It will be extremely difficult to, to, to recuperate. It will take ages and, and a lot of work and a lot of goodwill to, to recreate a narrative that keeps the, the, the two populations united after all these divisions and the fights and the, and the, and the, and the, and the civil war that, that, that has happened. Fighting these two narratives and recreating a real one is the struggle that we all have to undertake as much as possible. So thank you. I want to ask you each just the same question about what to do from here without asking you to solve the whole uh, Libyan civil war. We'll, we'll expect some help from the audience on that front uh, once we get started up here in the remainder of our time. But, but a, a couple of years ago with Fred Wary and John Allen and a few others from around town, we wrote a report in which we talked about trying to incentivize some of the local actors and militias and cities to try to improve their game, so to speak, in terms of governance and security and try to create a system of distribution of resources, keep the central government relatively weak, but of course try to strengthen it over time. And that was sort of our vision. That was before the events of the last 12 months or last 10 months. Is there anything left to be said on behalf of that vision? Uh, what should an alternative vision be if that one is now defunct? Uh, what's the path forward in Libya? And again, I don't expect a perfect answer but sort of what's the most important next thing or what's the most important big idea that we should have in mind in terms of what we're trying to achieve over time? Well, uh, let's say that Karim uh, started telling something very true and uh, important. I mean, we have to work uh, on uh, media coverage, in my opinion, and uh, on a different narrative that now is absolutely disruptive. Um, because in the end, people, even though at the beginning they don't think that things are like this, in the end they start to believe that there is effectively this uh, huge difference, uh, absolutely not, uh, that you cannot solve. So this is one point. Secondly, of course, the situation has really worsened in the last uh, year. When we were writing, uh, the paper on Libya and on uh, localism, uh, municipalizations, and so on, um, many things were different. I'm pretty sure that uh, many militias, uh, and the majority of the people in Tripoli, will find very difficult to start a real conversation with Aftar in this point. On the other side, you have Aftar that uh, 
bet on uh, many things uh, uh, starting this kind of uh, military operation towards uh, Tripoli. And now my, my belief is that uh, it will, it must win Tripoli. Uh, I think that it cannot go back uh, uh, to Benghazi without uh, any result. After all these months, after all the dead th they had, um, think, of, for example, that uh, at the beginning of the operation, many, many young boys uh, with no experience, uh, we've seen them uh, in videos and so on, were uh, killed during the operation, and they were from Cyrenaica, and maybe they are now in Garian, and uh, the parents cannot go and take them, you know, the, 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 the bodies. Mm -hmm. And so after all these, I think that for him will be very difficult to go, to go back uh, without a result. Plus, the situation in Benghazi is not so calm as uh, you know, the narratives say. And plus, in Benghazi also, it's full of extremist uh, groups. So I think that um, at the moment, the situation will, be, will remain like this. And uh, Berlin, the conference in Berlin was nothing, was com completely useless. That was in January or December? When, when it was, the conference, in January, January. Yeah. Uh, Kareem. The date in the night. Uh, nine, yeah, the nine, beginning, nine, nine, yeah. Something. Over to you, Kareem. Do you see any next step that we can at least, you know, even if we can't see the finish line, we can at least see what the next step should be? You sounded pretty pessimistic a minute ago, but yeah, is there well, any basis for... I'm Scorpio and I'm an Arab. I cannot be anything more than... <laughs> <laughs> it will be a cultural clash. <laughs> The problem that I've seen in doing analysis in following Libya, in, in, especially in the last four or five years, is that any time you, you study the situation on the ground, you see how it is evolving. Changes. You, yeah, exactly. You, you, you write down and, you, and, and you, you agree with your colleagues on a possible solution. To propose, 15 days later, it's done. over, it's done. So what, what would have functioned two years ago uh, and could have functioned uh, had everybody put their heads into doing that, what, what we wrote in the, in the Brooklyn report? doesn't mean anything anymore. Mm. What I'm really afraid is that this, the, the longer this civil war is lasting, the more is breaking the, 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 the good social fabric of the Libyan population. Yeah. Until, until before this invasion, you could be surprised by how much in, within anarchy, within disorder, the population could, could lead a legal life. You are a militiaman, you walk around with your, with your Kalashnikov, I've seen them entering a store, buying something, paying, and getting out. This is the, 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 Libya always has been without a real police force for years, for now, for years now. Now try to imagine any, any Western society, any city in the West, where you say, guys, there is no police for 24 hours. You can do whatever you want. And you will see the reaction. Libyans have been in a similar condition and have kept a, a, a social, a social modus vivendi with each other that, that allowed society almost without a superior structure to, to live and go on. And that, is, and that is, is, has been the, the treasure of the Libyans. I always, I always thought, until that is there, there is hope that a state can be built, that uh, we can build the structure to, 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 to develop and begin the work toward the pluralistic, democratic, uh, whatever that is. This, I am afraid that it's being broken, and it's been broken by the violent attack against Tripoli more than by the repression, the destruction of Benghazi, uh, what happened in Derna and all the other stuff, because it, it is a symbol of total disdain by a part supported by a very strong narrative towards another part. When you unleash bombardments against a civil city that is supposed to be the capital of the state that you want to conquer, the state that you want to liberate, that sends a terrible message, and a message that undermines completely all, all we have fought to maintain. And, and that is the root of my pessimism. That is offset by the optimism, as Gramsci used to say, you have the pessimism of the reason, you do the analysis and say that there's no way it will be solved. It is offset by the optimism of the will, which is the continued struggle for a mediation, the continued hope that somehow the international community can find a common, a common vision, a common intent to put pressure on the local factions 
to stop fighting and to begin reconciling, or vice versa, that there is an agreement, a tiredness within the population that pushes out the foreign proxy and find, whether through localism, whether through uh, any form, I found a way to re restart the, 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 the process. And that is, as it is now, I, I share Federica's opinion of, of the idea that the international conferences are, uh, are useless, they don't mean anything. I have more trust in the bilateral pressure that sta the states can do. I'm just making a for fantasy. But an Algerian, Egyptian entente on, how, on, on solving the, the Libya problem can do, in my opinion, much more than a Berlin conference where everybody comes up and says, yes, we are all in favor, and then a second later, continues the arming and the pushing of its own faction and the, and the structuring, and so on. You can design a, a, any possible outcome, a, a least desired one. It could be a, a Russian-Turkish agreement to a more desirable one that could be one under an international United Nations supervision at every degree in the middle. But that is the only way to, to work. Thank you. Well, let's take some questions from the audience, please, if you could wait for a microphone and and uh, give us your name before asking a question. We'll start with the gentleman here in the fourth row on the side, please. I'll take a few and, and then come back to you. Hey, Dr. White, could you talk a little bit about the interests of various foreign interlopers in this dispute? The various foreign actors. And then we've got Scott about 10 rows back, the curly red hair. Unmistakable. Thank you. I'm not sure that microphone's on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Scott Morgan. I'm a freelance security analyst covering West African issues. I would like you to comment on how the Hafter Offensive is actually leading to the deteriorating security climate in the Sahel, specifically in Niger, Burkina, and Mali, as we're finding that some of the unintended benefits of his offensive is he's driven some of the foreign fighters out of Libya. And there's a gentleman over here on the other side of the aisle, just please. Uh, good morning. My name is Pa from the Embassy of the Gambia. Uh, actually, I have two, two quick questions. Uh, the first one being, uh, what will be the uh, likely outcome between uh, Hafta and the uh, international uh, recognized government based in Tripoli? And the second one is, uh, should we blame the West for the present day chaos in Libya? Thank you. Sir. So why don't we come back, a uh, number of questions on the f table. Don't feel like you have to address each one, both of you, but why don't we start with you, Fadi? Well, uh, the situation with the international actors is uh, pretty clear. Um, there are uh, two, let's say, two... Um, sides. Yes, two sides. And um, they are more and more stronger. Uh, on one side of the Cyrenaica side, we have uh, the support of the Emirates, of Russia, uh, and of Egypt, as we said, and plus uh, uh, sometimes also, you know, uh, the hand of Saudi Arabia. And uh, on the other side, we have Qatar and uh, um, and, Turks, uh, and Turkey. Uh, each of these countries have a different um, interest in Libya. And uh, they are economics, uh, politics, uh, um, and uh, in many respects also uh, connected to the uh, international prestige. Um, so I, don't th I think that they have really spoiled uh, the chance and the possibility for uh, Libya to have uh, a, 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 a real path uh, for, for peace in this very moment. They are the real spoilers in many respects. Even though Libyans uh, have many, you know, did many mistakes in, in this process. Um, the, uh, the other question was on Haftar and uh, the war. How is it going? Did I understood? Um, I think that uh, Haftar destroyed every possibility to um, solve the question in Libya in the, in the next years, let's say, not months and not weeks, of course. 
And uh, this kind uh, of uh, action, military action, also disrupted, as you said, the situation in the Sahel. So uh, the less you have control in uh, the, the, the desertic part uh, of Libya, in the Fetsan, uh, which has no borders, as we know, um, the, the most you will have uh, problems with weapons, uh, with uh, uh, terrorism, and, and so on. So uh, again, I think that the military operation of Haftar has been really uh, a curse in many respects. Karim, do you want to add? Okay. No, I, I agree that the, the, the international situation sees, it looks clear. On one thing. I, I really believe it's extremely complex because every one of the actors, has, and we have seen each one of them having multiple allegiances and, and, and various behaviors. We all have been talking about oh, the Egyptians are changing their mind on Haftar, but the Emirates are pushing them in, the Russians are taking the place of the Russia. There, there, there has been a lot of talk, a lot of action, a lot of uh, distraction. Italy has been on the side of uh, Serraj, then pretend looked like he was, he was uh, endorsing, endorsing Haftar, then went mm. back. The, the role of the French, the, the, the role of the European Union as it is, the, the, the ambiguity of the international community has been really unbelievable. And, 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 and the consequences for the international system has not been, been, been understood yet. I was to a seminar last month in, in, in July, and a, an eminent colleague of mine, we were, we were on a taxi going back, he told me, Karim, what do you think? Do you think that 20 years from now, we will, the historians will look back at, at, at April and say that the 4th of April, the day of after the attack against Tripoli, when the Secretary General of the UN was there, sanctioned at the beginning of the end of the United Nations as a, as a, as a meaningful, powerful entity of the international community. And, and I thought a lot about it. And I think yeah, we, 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 the way the international community has behaved regarding Libya has consequences, will have consequences much far beyond the, 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 the mere how, events in Tripoli and in Libya. It, it will affect the international institutions, uh, which have poorly performed. It will affect the regional organizations. It will affect neighboring countries. It will affect political in, institutions. and. Uh, and states in, the, in, in Africa, and, and, and it is affecting what's going on in Europe. It is extremely complex, if you we if we, if we really want to have a deep understanding of what is going on, and try, and try to draw some, some conclusion out of it. Yeah, I completely agree, absolutely. I'm just going to add two points myself, and then we'll see if there's another round. Uh, in a month, on March 23rd, we're going to have another event with the Africa Security Initiative here with Professor Lise Howard from Georgetown who's written about the success of UN peace operations in Africa and elsewhere. And that'll maybe be a happier book. story. But there is, a, there is, of course, no UN peace observation or peacekeeping force inside of Libya today. That was one of the points we debated in our group, whether to recommend one. But we're a long ways from having any kind of a peace to monitor or keep in any event. Uh, so I take your point about uh, the UN taking a hit here. The UN has a lot of partial successes and sometimes big successes in other places, it's, you know, these, these missions don't have the muscle of a NATO operation, but uh, they have had a, a better than 50-50 track record, but of course they're not really being attempted now in Libya. So just um, one observation. One more observation, and it speaks also to the gentleman's question at the end. I once heard it said about 10 years ago by a very eminent Middle East expert, and this might have been true when he said it, but I'm sure it's not true anymore. Actually, I don't even think it was true when he said it that what happens in Libya stays in Libya. And I think it's almost exactly the opposite. Yeah. Because as the questions underscored, we've seen foreign fighters from Libya, many of whom were further radicalized and who improved their tactics, so to speak, during the broader wars of the Middle East and Iraq and elsewhere in the 2000s, then go southward. And they're contributing to much of the instability in the broader Sahel region. And we also know that Libya is such a sparsely populated and open terrain country that the flows can go in the other direction, too, to the extent that Libya is not able to take care of its own borders. We have the potential for large exodus from much of Africa into Europe. And of course, this is going to only be exacerbated by growing populations in Africa and many of the uh, changes with climate that are underway as well. So I think Libya is essentially a, a wide open, two-directional uh, swinging door with the, the movements of foreign fighters and of refugees. And this is a 
generally speaking, of, of no real benefit to anyone, uh, can't be healthy for the security of any of the region. I think it's a dynamic we've seen quite a bit in the last 10 years, only getting worse. So let's see if we have time for one last round of questions before we come back to the panelists for the, their, their final words. We'll start in the back. Yes, please. Hi. Th Ooh, that's loud. Okay. Hi. <laughs> this is Anwar Omish. I'm from the Libyan American Alliance. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, I think the first one is you, you rightly mentioned that Libya is very sparsely populated. The population itself is, is very small. Um, I, I'm curious about how the migration that has occurred since 2014, particularly from the east and the south to the west, how that's shaping um, internal dynamics and particularly narratives there. Um, that's the first question. And then the second question um, is to something Mr. Mizran said about, about the UN. Um, and I'm curious if you could talk briefly about the relationship between the UN's failure on Syria and the UN's failure on Libya um, and how those two things might together or differently herald the end of whatever international order that we have. We've got three questions up front. Yeah, we'll culminate with John Allen's. So we'll go huh. here first, and then we'll come back to you guys. For five you are, you're overestimating our, our memory. Yeah. <laughs> you want notes? You want? Yeah. Hi, Carl Golovin. One Libya question and one Italy question. Uh, under Gaddafi, Libya is one of the few countries that did not have a Western style, debt based, privately controlled central banking system. Uh, Gaddafi even held conferences about restituting a gold dinar coin circulating for oil transactions as the money of North Africa. So my question is, what, what is the current status of the system of money and banking in Libya? And concerning Italy, uh, what's become public that we can learn about NATO from what's been revealed about Operation Gladio in Italy? What, what, what? Gladio. Gladio. Could you repeat the second part of the, the second question regarding Italy? I didn't get it. I didn't understand you. I'm sorry. The second part of your question, the one regarding Italy. Uh, really for the, the young lady about uh, Italy, uh, there have been public hearings about what NATO was involved in uh, in terms of those protecting against terrorism actually providing the terrorism in Italy. So I was going to ask if you could please explain what has been revealed about NATO's role in Operation Gladio in Italy, not, not in Libya, but in Italy. And then over here, please. And then finally, John, after that. Dario uh, Cristiani, the IGMF fellow, the German Marshall Fund. Uh, I have a question linking uh, what's going on now with the history. Uh, Gaddafi was very keen in using instrumentally Omar al Mokhtar, like in his relationship, in his relations with Italy. Like we all remember that every time he was visiting Berlusconi, he, was, he used to have the picture of Omar al Mokhtar on, um, on his clothes. So, my question is is there uh, from both sides in Libya at the moment, uh, the same attempt to use history to justify what they have been, what they are doing. There, I've seen some attempts from the Haftar side to justify uh, their actions against the GNA as the GNA being the client of the Italian colonialist power first, and now of the Ottomans, like. Um, colonial, uh, colonial like uh, patterns, etc. So I want to ask from your point of view whether this kind of attempt has been, uh, to a certain extent, like structured, or it's a couple of tweets every now and then from specific actors. Thank. You. Thank you. Thank and then you. Finally, President Allen. Yeah. I'm John Allen. I work here. Um, two two quick things. Uh, if Mike, on the back of that book, some folks have shown some interest yes. in it. It might be interesting to reflect some of that. Second thing is, and this is for anyone in the audience who would know, uh, what the current state of U.S. policy is with regard to Libya. Uh, well, that's my question. Uh, you know, we have what I think would be the, the uh, punitive U.S. support for the GNA, yet we have uh, tweets going out on a regular basis uh, extolling the virtues of Hatar. So I leave that for the panel or someone perhaps from the State Department who would like to confess to being part of the State Department uh, to offer us some help on what the, the uh, policy is. Excellent. So okay. Kareem, you want to start, and then we'll give the last word to Fetty, and then I will ha I'll actually have the last word because I'm going to read Jim Mattis's and John Allen's endorsements of this book uh, in closing. But please. Yes, the first question regarding the population movement. I think it is massive 
but still too early for us to assess the exact consequences that it's going to bring towards the political structure and the economic structure. There are a lot of internally displaced people that once peace is restored can go back. But there is a, a lot of migrants who, who, who moved in, who cannot leave, and then they're settling there. I have a friend who came from Mubari, and uh, an old guy, and he told me uh, already a year ago that what was happening in the South was an incredible demographic change. He said, I, I don't recognize mo 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 most of the people in my city, most of the people in, in my neighborhood. And this is, is we, we, there are not enough information, not, not, not enough way to really understand the depth of the change. How many migrants really came from, for, 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 for a hundred of various reasons, came, 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 came from the Sahelian countries and, the south and, st and, and, sat and settled down there? And how many are moving up north? I, I, I really believe that this will be one of the major issues that once, God willing, the war is, is finished and the states start to, 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 to rebuilding, the, the gigantic issue would be to re, 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 reorganize the population, re, redraw the borders, redraw the, the, the limits of civic, of civic engagement. And also, and that's something I will never be tired to say, the real, the, 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 the real winner of all of this are the criminal organizations, which are becoming extremely powerful in Libya. And it went beyond any comparison I could make with the, with, with the post-World, Second World War situation in Calabria or in Italy in Italy or in Sicily, where the mafia was destroyed by fascism, started being, was rebuilt by the complacency of the Americans in order to be utilized to subject the population, and, and, and they really dominated the, the, the island and took the power, power for themselves. In Libya, it's, it's 10 times more than that. They really control it. They have cash. They have weapons. They have, they have a structure and an organization that will be extremely difficult, much more difficult to, 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 to defeat this criminal net, net, network or criminal organization then defeating terrorism or ISIS or, or Al-Qaeda or, or, or whoever uh, taking, uh, taking its place. Uh, your question whether it is history invoked today. That's an interesting question. Uh, which I really haven't thought. Well, uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, a tool as, uh, as Gaddafi, sometimes Haftar, but of course uh, it's not interesting in this moment uh, moving anything uh, against Italians. But yes, when uh, Haftar has to give his comments on Italy, it's always that we were the colonizers and uh, uh, that we, you know, the, the GNA is our slave uh, and so on. But it's just a kind of offense. I don't think at the moment, as far as I know, that there is a real structure um, propaganda yeah. in this. We must always, sorry, Karim, be attentive uh, in, 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 you know, in the relationship with Libya, of course, because we have a huge and strong and rooted past in, in, in this. And so um, it's very easy to fall down. Yeah, and uh, do you remember, for example, uh, the event uh, with the, the former ambassador, the Italian ambassador Perrone, when uh, there was yeah. the scandal about the uh, you know race, uh, the car race, uh, and the picture about that? Uh, you know, it's but, very easy to yeah, manipulate but, but, that. But, uh, I don't know whether you were asking that because there, there, there is always a, a manipulation of history for political propaganda. For yeah. your thing. and that and that is not, you know, just, there is, but there is an interpretation of history that is. To be, uh, to be discussed. And that is, for example, all, all that happened in the East against the Turks, all the debates of the Turks, the Arabs. It's, that, that, that interpretation of history is, is, is the, the, the real dangerous one, the one that builds a total different understanding of the national identity, a total different understanding of how you can rebuild the national identity through an interpretation of a selected history that hides certain parts and then lights certain others. And that is not yet well developed. It, my, my, my fear is if, that if, if, if this state of, of affairs continues for, for, for another year or two and you, and you begin to have a de facto partition of the country, which is different from federalism, decentralization, it's just de facto partition. Mm. Uh, Haftar is, or whoever succeeded him is going to hold his authority over a certain part of the country and another one, another part of the country, then you will see 
the, the slow development by the, the few intellectuals of, from each side to develop a, an understanding of history, the imagined communities idea. How do you rebuild the national, in, in order to strengthen your consensus, in order to develop your, your, your hegemonic power in the international community so to have rec rec recognition and so on. And that has not been there yet, but I see the embryo of this potential creation of a, of a narrative historically based that could then define the, the, the distinction within, within the country. Thank you, Kareem. Freddy, over to you for the last words. Yeah. Um, well, uh, to answer to our president uh, about the United States, uh, I think that there, we are in front of a kind of evolution mm -hmm of uh, you know the 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 united states uh, um, diplomats and uh, you know government uh, about libya so at, at the beginning of the service of uh, general mattis as secretary of defense uh, there was for sure the interest at least uh, you know from some leadership american leadership about solving the question in libya because libya has and is something much more than just Libya. But it has a huge strategic importance. So uh, Mattis saw exactly this, and he said, I want to do something in, uh, in order to solve and help to solve uh, the problems in Libya. Um, nowadays, uh, it's pretty disappointing, I, I'd say. And there are many uh, calls from uh, uh, Libyans to, for the United States to act many in the last few days also. But um, the United States uh, in this moment uh, seems to be miss you know, missing in action in many respects. And plus, I would say something about the okay. American ambassador, can I? Oh, of course, yeah. that's me. When, uh, when uh, you know, he goes uh, and he meets, uh, first of all, uh, as, you know, last day, uh, General Haftar, in this way, United States are giving importance to these men, and um, which is, I don't think, a very good thing. I know that I cannot go to Cyrenaica anymore at this point, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. Can I just say one thing uh, regarding American policy? I really believe that to, uh, to try to understand what the if there is a policy and what, uh, what is the policy, we have to put the United States into its bigger role. Libya is... Uh, I, I always thought that Libya is, the United States could tell the Iraqi, the, 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 the Emirati and the Egyptians back off. It has the leverage to do it. But if you insert it within the, 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 the wider geopolitical and, and, and strategic interest of the United States, I'm afraid that Libya is not worth a fight with the Egyptians or a struggle with the Emirati or, or any other actor for that. Libya is seen as a lesser important country by the American administration at this point. Not, not worth that, that kind of struggle, that, that kind of, of, of entanglement. Unfortunately, it is that swinging yeah. uh, screen door in and out of Europe and the Sahel. Uh, what currency is used in Libya today, what, what, most commonly? The dinar. Uh, and uh, n as opposed to the dollar or other international currencies uh, in, in practical terms? Oh, the lira. Yeah. The lira. Okay. Right. Uh, let me just conclude by, again, thanking you all for being here and, okay. and also honoring Fetty with a couple of quick blurbs, one from Jim Mattis. Packed with timeless lessons, no other account rivals this skillful dissection of Italian counterinsurgency in Africa. Dr. Fascinati's rigorously researched gem is now the standard, revealing as it does the human factors and strategies that dominate war. And John Allen wrote, there has been almost no principal treatment of the Italian counterinsurgency experience in Africa until now. It is an experience rich with lessons which, for a variety of reasons, mostly political, were lost to Italians and the wider community of students of military history. And the work of Dr. Fascinati is therefore of particular importance. So please consider purchasing and getting signed your copy today. And thank you again for coming. Please join me in thanking these two. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.